My name is Maria, and you are listening to the podcast where we deconstruct someone's PhD experience so that you can reconstruct your own. This is a journey with many challenges, but you might find yourself in a similar situation as one of the guests here. Enjoy listening. For me, number three has a special meaning. It's like third time luck. Is that the thing in English? The third time is a term. And I specifically wanted you to be a part of the episode three. I really appreciate that we are working together and that you accepted to be part of this personal project. So very grateful for that. I'm very happy that you actually asked me because as I already said, I really appreciate this little project of yours and I fullheartedly support it. Thanks. Because I don't introduce people in the beginning, maybe <laughs> I ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> what do you want people to know about you before we start this conversation? Vitek de Boer. I am Managing Director of Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute at uh, Eindhoven University. I'm almost here for a year now. I'm uh, loving it a lot. Not only because I am kind of back in academia, which I love. But also I love it a lot because of the people I work. So that's a very important thing for me to be in a team with people I enjoy working with. And we create this very strong team. Well, I can say from the other side, mutual feeling, really. In the beginning when the institute was created, it was a bit... Well, let me now share this thing immediately. <laughs> I was working with middle-aged men. Here, here. I positioned myself in a way to become similar to them. So I did not allow myself too much to bring out some of the feminine side of mine. I don't divide male-female. I divide really masculine and feminine energy. As a female, we can also have masculine energy. As a male, we can have feminine energy. And we have both. So it just depends in which ratio. So there was this very uniform mindset. I was trying to fit in there. And then you came and you stirred the soup. Male soup. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you spiced it up. <laughs> then I realized the importance of the role model and how important it is to see somebody that you can identify with and say, yes, one day that can be me. Because in full honesty, I cannot see an older Dutch guy and say, one day it's going to be me. I completely relate to that. I grew up in an environment. I studied physics, did my PhD in physics. There was no role model, no female role model. My only female role model I had was a 600-year-old Russian lady who was very effective. We did a lot of collaborations together, but a little bit of a different style than uh, I could foresee for myself. But the rest was just male. In that sense, I relate to you when you say you try to adapt. And for me, I also had to make this decision and transition that instead of behaving like a dude and becoming one of the guys, I had to come to terms with my feminine side embrace it and also be proud of it and this all in an environment which actually is not appreciative of all these characteristics and all these features and it's very often labeled as negative so that's another thing which while struggling with those things yourself you also have to defend it and that makes it hard but nonetheless worth it because you can be yourself. I remember one talk, it was from a Philips HR, and they were saying one of the things they wanted to change is to put mixed a jury for the interviews. Because if you always have, like, I don't know, five male on one side of the table and you have a female entering or a male entering, all this like unconscious mm. bias, you are immediately going to relate to somebody who is, uh, of course, looking like you. So having a more mixed... Mm -hmm. Committee and jury makes things more transparent. Let's just say having a complete male environment, it's limiting. Having a complete female environment, it's limiting. You both bring qualities and it's all about the appreciation, respect and embracing those qualities. And I feel that there is still some very hard work to be done because when it comes to the appreciation of those qualities and those characteristics, I feel it's very one-sided. 
did, where even as a female, if you display male characteristics, so for example, for myself, I feel I have quite the masculine energy. What I notice is that if I display certain behavior, I'm being decisive or I'm being opinionated or I'm being passionate about something. So if I'm being decisive, I'm being bossy. If I'm being opinionated, I'm controlling. And if I'm being uh, passionate, I'm emotional or even hysterical. Like I've heard all of the above. I've never heard someone call a guy bossy. He's just a boss. The double standard thing. Nowadays we are talking, let's bring more female into this STEM sciences. Ultimately, it's about each of us developing more of these characteristics and traits, what you speak I mean, about. I agree. Every person needs to have this balance. Yeah. And what you say also, everyone never is 50-50. You always have a tendency to lean toward yeah. one or the other. There is so much more about diversity where, I mean, I'm not even talking about cultures, but there's sexuality, there is no room for men who do have a lot of female energy. That's true. Another, if you are one of these men who used to expressing these feelings, the academic environment is not really that environment to allow for that. Not yet. Not yet. By the way, we are going to change that. Maria. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I do see the people you listen to and take special care that they tend to be the more, you know, between quotation marks, loyal members. It does actually have a strong effect. It's logical if you look at your own family situation or your relationships and nurturing, it makes for a healthy relationship. Yes. It makes for healthy friendships. So why not have that in a work environment? It's actually silly when you think about it that it's not more prominent there. One of the recurring things when I spoke with PhD students was that they didn't often get the question, how do you feel? How are you doing? It's not only what are the results you are bringing to this meeting, but how are you dealing with all the results that you are bringing to this meeting? Again, in a relationship, this is something you are actually aware of, how your partner is feeling. And if your partner isn't feeling right, you know, you communicate. It's another thing. And it's amazing. So many studies which have shown that happy people actually produce better and more results in the short term, in the long run. Especially as a supervisor, you have the responsibility because people are dependent on you. These PhD students, they are relying on you to provide a safe environment for them. It's your responsibility as a supervisor to make sure your PhDs are feeling comfortable and safe enough to discuss whatever they want or need. And if you're not doing that, then there is some work for you. That's my honest opinion. <laughs> Could you shine some light on why in the first place did you choose uh, to do a PhD? Why in the first place you chose physics? I come from a family of scientists, basically. My dad, he's a chemist. And during my high school years, I very much liked physics, chemistry, math. Wasn't too brilliant at it. I mean, I was okay. By the time that I had to choose directions, I just plainly got the advice that I should study language, whatever. So this was all along the way. I should not do this. And I have to say, this is because of my dad. He was like, you like it? You can do it. You're intelligent enough. This has nothing to do with it. So just do what you like. Against everyone's advice, I started uh, going more into the exact science uh, direction. And then for my studies, I got uh, the negative advice. Don't do it. Blah, blah, blah. I did it anyway. After all, physics is fascinating. Also, what I very much liked is that the physics you get in high school has no relation with what you get in university. University physics is so much more fascinating. You start studying things which, you know, you learn that things are just a theory until proven correctly by experiments. In high school, you get everything presented as facts and then you learn, uh, you know, there are some uh, gaps in things, which makes this is a challenge. This is why you're a scientist. You're, you know, when you're this first your students this is your motivation you're going to you're going to be the one to fill that gap yeah that really got me enthusiastic and uh, I was doing my graduation project with this uh, wonderful guy Tom Gregory 
Cambridge, professor at the university then. Yeah, we had such a good interaction and I got so motivated that he offered me a PhD. I mean, I found that I just was really good at experiments, doing experiments. So I started my PhD while we chose a topic which was really hot. And so you go with the flow, nanotechnology for solar energy, which was then the holy grail. We were kind of riding that wave. We got some very nice results in the very beginning of my PhD. And so after that, it was basically just producing papers and yeah, one paper after the other, basically. So that's also the importance of being in the right place in the right time. Of course. I mean, there is a large part of your PhD where you have to be lucky with one, your advisor, again, comes down to people, the people you work with, but also the topic. So if the topic is hot and sexy and there's a lot of attention for it, there is also a lot of money, which means a lot of opportunity. You get to be at conferences, speak to all the right people. The nice thing about doing a PhD I also found is that in a very short period of time, you become a world expert on something. That was really the sort of high of the PhD. Combined with the relative freedom you still have, you have the freedom to organize your day and night <laughs> as you want. <laughs> and weekend. And weekends. <laughs> For a PhD, you're generally working very hard, which for me, it's not a problem. Also, I'm this type, once I get momentum, I easily work 60 to 80 hours a week. And then at some point, something happened in parallel a little bit in my personal life. In combination with that stress, I kind of got into a screeching halt, so to say. That was also the moment that I realized there is no room for that. The moment that you actually say stop because things are not going very well. I felt there was not really room to talk about it. And there was no platform to ask for help and not to share it because you don't want to be that only one and also one of the only girls doing a PhD who is done going through a rough patch and having a rough face and then having to ask for help. The moments I try to very lightly touch on it by people, they say like, it's your mid PhD crisis. Everyone has it. You just have to suck it up. Not even asking what it was about. Just like you had an off week, day, month, well, then you're stretching it, huh? but you're having a PhD, mid PhD crisis, now get over yourself. With fellow PhDs, you're always in this mode where you're complaining about basically random stuff, you know, your experiments not working. God, my supervisor, you know what he did today. But when it comes to taking care of your mental health profoundly, there is not too much attention for that. In the end, I went and found myself a therapist, which really helped. If anything, I can recommend it to anyone. Fully on board with you here. Yeah. <laughs> Was not the first therapist or the last I saw, but for that period, it doesn't even have to be a person who understands doing a PhD. Because even when you talk about it with your friends who are not doing a PhD, you always have this feeling they don't understand what I'm going through. You can only discuss it with fellow PhDs and they are in an equal amount of stress and might not always have that room and time in their own lives to deal with yours. It really can feel like being stuck. And that was that was really that feeling what I, which I had. I'm stuck and I don't know how to get out of it. It also gives you a little bit of a, a reference system where you get so much imprinted by the idea that doing a PhD is so special and it's so on top of the world. It's the best thing and it's the most special thing and you should be happy to be there and it's the opportunity which is created for you and all those things. And in the end, you know, the therapist just saying like, sounds like a stressful job and you're like, oh, it's not a job. And in the end, it's a job. My PhD was between two countries, between two institutions, between two clean rooms. So that only one clean room brings enough of problems. <laughs> Having two clean yeah. rooms in your PhD. It's not even the sum. It's, uh, yeah. I remember we were in a, um, like a metro station with a friend of mine. We were doing the same PhD between two countries, two clean rooms, two freaking um, messes. And we were saying, can you imagine when we finish this PhD and we find a job and we don't like it, we will be able to quit. So really in our minds, it was never a possibility to quit. We saw this as the PhD, this is me. 
if I quit on the PhD, your baby. I quit on myself as well. And you don't take into account all the nervous breakdown that you're going through uh, in certain periods. That's It's sort of part of the package. I mean, if no one else in your environment takes it seriously, who the hell are you <laughs> to take it seriously? It's either apparently everyone is going through the same stuff, so why are you the one complaining? Or no one is going through the same stuff, so why are you complaining? And it's very funny. I was talking, you know, with my brother about this. Uh, he studies physics and chemistry as well. He said, you know, when you come to think about it, it kind of has the characteristics of a cult. They create this very isolated environment where everyone is keeping this sort of feeling alive, where this is the standard. And when you start complaining, you're reprimanded for it. Sheer coincidence. A few weekends ago, I had a whole weekend of watching cult documentaries. So, <laughs> ask me anything. No. <laughs> so, there is this uh, relationship of dependence. A lot of people, including myself, I didn't even think twice. I mean, I love research. Like, I love doing experiments. I love being locked up in a lab with a laser and not see any other photons than the ones which come out of my laser. I graduated. I felt I was not done. Of course, I was going to do a PhD. I mean, not even considering that maybe I could do these experiments or this kind of research also in the company. I didn't even think about it twice. My supervisor, he offered me a position. I was like, sure, of course. Don't have to ask. Like, uh, just natural stop, stop bothering me. I'm in the lab. Now you have this very clear goal in mind. You have to get the title. A lot of people, including myself, there was not a single moment during that mid-PhD crisis. And I can tell you, I felt bad. I felt horrible. There were days that I couldn't get out of my bed. There was not a single moment, not even then, that I thought, maybe I should quit. If it makes me this unhappy, maybe I should stop. I didn't want to be perceived as a quitter. It was a slow process to get back on the horse. I was actually in a more fortunate position because I had done so many experiments during my graduation project, which is supposed to be one year, which is two years for me. And then in the first few years of my PhD, I did so many experiments that I basically needed the rest of my PhD to analyze everything and write papers. So the load and pressure on me to perform. In 2010, I had my first nature paper, which I hate to say is still viewed as a standard of being a good scientist, which cites Mark Intermet. So one of the papers I'm actually the most proud of is a paper I designed the experiment, analyzed the whole thing different, like a new analysis method. It's an applied physics letter, which is an impact factor of two or three. Let's just say basically the pressure was off. There is also this internal drive. You try to get as much out of it as, uh, as possible. So I kept producing papers like there is no tomorrow. When you recover from that and stress is relatively gone, stress was the thing which kept you going. Then is the whole like motivation issue thing. Mm, how did you get back your motivation? For me, motivation was also focusing a lot on other things. My supervisor, he made sure that I kept busy with <laughs> whatnot. And it was actually really nice that he was, um, because he was really foreseeing academic career for me. And he was really pushing for that. And he involved me in a lot of politics, you know, in um, dynamics in the institute, just to make me aware, which is, I mean, as a PhD student, you're not aware of what you're just Oh, you're no. so much focused on no one is touching my samples and when I can I exactly. get measuring time on, on the setup and those kind of things that you're not even aware what's playing on the background and uh, behind closed doors. But he actually included me in that, which was very useful. I got to learn a lot about the dynamics and the politics and the power plays and those kind of things. Did you see for yourself this academic career at that point? I did, because I very much liked science. I still was under the impression you are going to bring this piece of science which is going to change the world. When I got my first nature paper, oh my god, I partied hard. Everyone around me was also like, oh, you know, it's the biggest achievement you can get. And I mean, this is basically your product as a researcher, as a, especially as a PhD. This is your product. You have to produce papers. And then you get this one. Oh my god. And there is put so much value on to it that you kind of lose perspective with reality because 
in the end, what did my nature paper bring? Nothing. This was all about implementing the nanotechnology we were studying into photovoltaics. So it was a great idea. And still, I am a great advocate for fundamental physics. I'm all about, you know, you stuck me in a dark lab and I start doing experiments. This is why I loved working with my PhD advisor. I was funded from an STW, which is currently GTW project, which had a very clear goal. We're going to work towards X percent more efficient uh, solar cells by the use of nanoparticles. So I was doing experiments in the lab and I found some effects, which I tried to look up in the literature. I couldn't find it. I discussed it with my supervisor and he was like, ah, hmm. Could be artifact, could be, I don't know. I was like, I don't know either, but I think it's interesting because I did this and this and this checkup and if it should be this effect, I should see this and I don't see it. If it should be that effect, I should see that. And I said, I don't see that. He was like, you know what? You're probably a better expert on this than I am. Um, so if you think it's interesting, go to it. So I did this and it turned out that it was some effect which no one studied before because uh, this was a different method to use, different analysis to use, and it turned out to be the most relevant thing for the project, which we didn't know beforehand. But the fact that he just gave me the trust and the freedom to do this, to explore this in the end, and this is also like something, sort of the most credit you can get as an experimental physicist, in the end, someone wrote, got another nature paper published on the theory behind the experiments I did. So that's kind of a... (gasps) The theorists agree. (laughs) (laughs) The fundamental confirmation. Yeah, I know. (laughs) How did your journey progress from that point onwards? I love the idea of being a scientist, being locked up in the lab, but I very much became aware, due to my supervisor also, is that, I mean, he was never in the lab. I don't think at some point he even knew how to switch on the laser anymore. So he wasn't doing experiments, he was just there to manage the group. Okay, if this is the path which I need to follow, that means I have, what, three, four years left of doing science because I'm a postdoc and then I basically become a group leader and that's finito for me. I was a little bit struggling with that, also not knowing what to do otherwise, because the thing is that as a PhD, you're completely isolated from the real world. So I started asking around, doing a postdoc. Basically, every postdoc I talk to say, run, (laughs) run while you still can. (laughs) Don't fall into the trap. So of course I went to do a postdoc. (laughs) (laughs) Reminds me of a girl I was listening once talking about toxic relationships. And she was like, you know, there's a narcissist coming your way. What do you do? You put those Nikes, you put those Adidas and you run, baby, you (laughs) run. (laughs) So you ran towards the postdoc. (laughs) Well, I got offered a postdoc position at Columbia University in New York and I never had any ambition to go to New York. In hindsight, everyone else reacting like, oh no, oh my God. You gotta take it, right? But the reason why I took it actually was that I was like, okay, let's go for this job interview. I don't know what to do otherwise anyway, so I just go for the job interview. And it was this old guy, and he was like the sweetest guy, and the whole conversation we had was all about, I'm so about the people. This is the most important thing for me. I talked to his postdoc, and he was like, yeah, you know, this is a great guy, and you sh- you know, do this, blah, blah, blah. So I ended up taking it, moved to New York, and basically the first day, I started this postdoc he took me to the lab and he's like this is the worst decision of your life this guy is the devil he will make your life a living hell why not say this the first time when you met him uh exactly my words he was like i tried this once with one of the other applicants for the job and the applicant actually asked the guy about it saying like, hey, your postdoc is saying this and this, where is this coming from? And so he said, I almost got fired. But why is this guy staying in this group? Is this, if that's the worst decision of everybody else's life, but for him it works or what? He left the group, of course, at some point, but it's one of those situations where this guy was Chinese and he was relying on the visa. And this is also how he started treating me. I was relying on him because of the visa and he started treating me like shit. It's another culture. Columbia is an Ivy League University, they have different standards. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, Horrible Bosses. No. Based on a true story. 
I mean, it's an exaggeration and funnily it's not. So this guy, he was just making my life a living hell. I applied for another postdoc position just because I wanted to leave there. And I got into completely different fields, which was neuroscience. There was this brain initiative to understand the brain. How does the brain work? All different fields of science were required, not just biology, everything. And we should all work together. So I went to this guy. I said, very interesting. I'm a physicist. I'm very interested in neuroscience. I bluffed my way in, in the most American way possible. After a year, I became full-on American. I gave a presentation, no one understood anything. So after he said, what does nanotechnology offer? Problems we have in biology that nanotechnology can save. And I'm like, name it. Nanotechnology has a solution. <laughs> the most disgusting one-liner of any movie. But in the end, it was the truth. They had all these very mundane problems like stability and uh, brightness and all these uh, biomarkers, foods, which are actually very toxic. So you get mice who go like, ah, ah, ah. And nanotechnology, you just spray some nano stuff on it and everyone is happy, it works, everything is stable. By that time, I was, uh, again, very enthusiastic eh? because I was in a new field. I could ask all the stupid questions I wanted because you're new and no one understood what I was doing. So that was also um, also lonely. There is mm. no one to discuss with. You need to have this bounce around. The physics worked out very nice. Biology was uh, just... <laughs> I now know that the never do experiments on a Monday when there is full moon and the, the biology won't work. But that was also, in the end, a very different experience and also the one which made me decide just to quit academia. What happened? In the end, the postdoc advisor of my last postdoc, the neuroscience postdoc, he would sometimes storm into the lab, make eye contact with a person and just yell until that person would cry. What he often did and what I also got the same treatment was that he he held me in like the golden child and for the first period you know I was dragged everywhere and look at this I got myself a physicist and the physicist can do anything she's going to solve all, uh, all our problems and by the way with projects he thought of while well, he did not understand any physics but I put it in his head and then he made it look like he designed it and he thought of it and then from one day to the next he decided it wasn't going fast enough and then things turned around also because he was just crazy and he also he harassed me at some point there was an evening he told me like please come home with me my wife isn't home my kids aren't home what and this is also a situation which I now in hindsight I regret I didn't take the steps which I now should take I went to the ombudsman there at the university the person basically said oh it's this guy yeah you're not the first person I recommend you to quit your job and go look for some, you know, something else. So everyone is covering for him. It was very unknown story that he was doing this. I wasn't the first. I surely am not the last. The more people I talked to, the more people said, yeah, it's, I think it's better you move on because the moment you confront, he will make your life a living hell. I'm like, my life is already a living hell. <laughs> like, I have to see this guy in the lab. I got disappointed by the fact that specifically there in the US at Columbia University, this whole culture was so much preserved and protected. I mean, he's still there. He's still doing the same thing. This is cult mentality. I don't want to compare that culture with the culture we have here because the US example, which I just gave you, that's exaggeration. But for me, it was straw, which broke the camel's back. There is a, a whole thing which accumulated effect of being a woman in that field, in the field of physics, which at some point got too much for me. I mean, this was a clear Me Too situation and that I haven't particularly addressed because I said you don't want to be perceived as this weak one. You're already one of the single girl in the group, da-da-da. But there is this constant hostile behavior and treatment of your fellow male colleagues and professors. I had to justify so much for being there. It started out with my male mentor in my first year. I come from a different system in the Netherlands where after the first year you actually got your certificate your first year certificate this was pre-bachelor master and so my mentor he approaches me and he says that's so nice of you to be here for whom are you here 
What? Yeah, I was like, I came to pick up my certificate, my diploma. And he's like, really? You? Just a sheer surprise. First, he gave me a negative advice. But then that I got my diploma after one year. Only a few people get that. Most of the students, they have at least one or two subjects they have to do a reset on. I got it in my first year and he was utterly surprised. But then there is this constant questioning of what I'm doing there. The first time I walk into the first class we had ever special relativity theory this guy walks up to me he says you're in the wrong class and I go like is this special relativity theory and he goes like he opens his mouth he's like you're not a psychology student because the class was actually in a psychology building he saw me walk in a girl and he just approached me he said you're in the wrong class not like what class do you need to be in da, da. so with every paper I published I had to explain to people yes I did those experiments myself Yes, no one helped me analyze. Yes, I wrote the paper myself. Actually, in fact, I did design the experiment myself. It's not the standard experiment. I did that myself. If you need a man to mansplain to you that he didn't think of this, I did. And my supervisor actually was supportive. He gave me all the credit. He gave his students all the credit. So he would literally say like, of course Vitka did it. She's my best student. So he would just played out said and because of his support and his protection also huh? people started treating us as a group differently coming back are there any other factors that decided that you absolutely don't want an academic career yes there are i have to say that the accumulation of things which i mentioned before you know being treated the way i was treated it's a big one i started to not like how the scientific environment started to develop into. So there was so much pressure from government and European Union. You know, when Maxwell wrote down his equations, he wasn't aware that years from then we would all be using a cell phone based on those equations. So sometimes there are things which you can't predict, but you don't. if you don't give room for that, no unexpected beautiful things can happen, which is what science is. It's a very interesting experience to be back in academia and to be back in a completely different position. How come? Because now I don't have that stress, which I feel a lot of researchers have of getting that funding. There's the constant, am I being evaluated by my peers and my colleagues and my faculty and my institute and my university in the way that I want to be perceived? And I don't have that stress at all. I mean, I of course I'm running an institute and I very very much I'm going to make this institute um, a great success but when it comes to all those things I don't have to work on my publications I don't have to work on my resume in that regard it's very different kind of stress if you would look back on your experience with the knowledge that you have nowadays is it something you would do differently funnily enough choosing physics Studying physics, doing my PhD, I don't think I would. I might have chosen a slightly different topic which wasn't available by the time I started studying. I'll be the first one to say that this whole experience brought me a lot. It brought me standing up for myself, independence, realizing that although from high school on I was told that I couldn't do physics wasn't for me, I shouldn't do it. And then I end up with a PhD cum laude, which no one saw coming. In the end, that was more sealed to myself. You don't have to prove anything to anyone because through them all, you're doing it for yourself. What I would have changed is to step up for myself more when it comes to unacceptable behavior, harassment, inappropriate behavior. I could seriously, seriously write a book. And in all of these situations, I either ignored it or I brushed it away, brushed it aside. He probably didn't mean that. He probably didn't mean to touch that. He probably didn't mean to say that. He probably da da da. And there is always this, I don't want to be the hysterical one making a fuss about this. In that regard, yes, I wish I would have done that to all female and male PhDs or whoever out there who are listening to this. If you do find yourself in a situation where you do recognize that's not okay, be hysterical or whatever they effing call it. Just call it out. You're the only one who can do that. Call it out. 
Thanks. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, well, a little bit <laughs> relive this whole piece. <laughs> it's a recurring element, you know, people come here and we go through this process. Now it's different when you look at it backwards. Of course, yeah. So uh, this is one hour that you can tell it in a go. All the emotions are building up and building up, all this experience coming I'm back. I'm also, now I hear myself talk about it. I'm putting emphasis on things where five years ago I would have put so much negative energy on things where or focus on things where now a little bit further I appreciate things more but then while talking about it I heard myself going through this whole process this whole program and then like no no no, wait wait no actually the stress already started from day one at some point mid PhD crisis no but how do I get to this mid PhD crisis there was already a bunch of stress before that it didn't come because i had relationship issues with my partner that was accumulation of a lot of things once again thanks a lot really means a lot to me personally that i can have such openness with my boss to come and present what i'm doing in my private time and ask you if you want to be a part of it and you're fully on board and then you share stories some stories that i've never heard before that you shared right now I'm super grateful well I'm very grateful that you also introduced me to part of your personal life which I very much appreciate and admire goes both ways really thanks did you notice how freely Vitika shared many painful moments throughout her journey even though they were emotionally difficult topics whatever the question asked there was no taboo in this conversation and not only in this one, but in general with her. It made me wonder about a communication style she has developed along the way to stand up for herself, to directly address difficult conversations, and then create an environment where people feel heard and open to share. And it related to something I've recently heard. Good leaders address things immediately. Do you, as a leader of your PhD project or your work, address things immediately? I encourage you to share what you need as a support from your environment. This is also something I've recently learned. How do you express what kind of support do you need? Of course, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get it. But if you don't ask for it, you are not going to get it. As a friend of mine would say, if you don't ask, the answer is always a no. So for example, if you want to be guided by a manager, share what kind of guidance do you need? And then you will discover for yourself what's possible and what's not. The risk of going forward might be lower than the risk of staying in the same spot. Wishing you a lot of luck. Thanks for listening to this podcast episode. If there was anything that you discovered or found remotely interesting, do share. I'm always curious to hear what is it that you resonated with. See you in the next episode.